in spirit and in truth. We could be anywhere else, but it wouldn't be better than being here. Is that all right? God is good to us. He's been good to us all. No matter our circumstances, no matter our situations, God is a good God. Is that all right? Before we allow God to speak to our hearts, let's speak to him to help us to receive with meekness his engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. Let us pray. Holy Father, we come to you. You was able to do above all that we ask or even think. Father, we thank you for your love toward us, us who are not worthy of the great love that you have for us, especially in the sending of your son for the redemption of man. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for being mindful of us, and we thank you for the privilege and honor that we all have in this place to be here, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And now, dear God, we understand that it's not by chance nor coincidence that we all right now have the opportunity to hear your word and what you have to say to us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your word will find place in our hearts. And we pray, Heavenly Father, as we talk about being our brother's keeper, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to understand that we are to love one another, not as the world loves, but as you have loved us. We thank you, Father, and we ask this prayer in faith and give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 1 Corinthians 12 has something for us as the body of Christ. We are one body, but many members. And we have to understand that as the members of the one body of Christ, we all have a function. The word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse 18, but now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it pleased him. I want you to know this morning that it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. And this body is his and he sets us in his body as it pleases him and not you and not me. Is that all right? You see, sometimes we, we can get to bickering and, and get uh, to be frustrated with one another because we're not where we think we ought to be in the body of Christ. But the truth of the matter is, wherever you are, that's where God wants you to be. Is that all right? And no matter if you're an eye, no matter if you're a hand, no matter if you're a foot, thank God that you're in the body of Christ. He says, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now they are there many members yet but one body and the eye cannot say to the hand I have no need of thee nor again the head to the feet I have no need of thee or of you nay much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness, for our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lack. In other words, Christians, those among us who you think are, are not worthy, or who you think that are, are not important, God says those are the most important ones. Is that all right? And he says that there should be no schism or division in the body. I shared with the class on yesterday that we need to understand that the body of Christ, the mystery of godliness is that the church, the body of Christ is to reflect the Godhead. And there's no division, there's no schism between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
They're not arguing day in and day out with who has more authority than the other. Because they're all one. They're all on the same page. And the body should reflect the same thing. Is that all right? He says that there should be no schism, no division in the body, but watch this. But that the members, amen, the members, y'all ain't hearing me, the members, are you one? The members should have the same care one for another. No big eyes, no little use in the body of Christ. And he said he's instructed that all members have the same care one for another. Is that all right? We'll get that in a minute. We should have the same care for one another. You see, the, the, the fact of the matter is that no matter what your function in, in the body is, all of us are, are necessary. Amen. And all of us should have the same care one for another. Because I'm just going to tell it like it is. Sometimes in the church, sometimes we prefer others sometimes more than other people. And that's not what the body should be. It's, amen. The body should have the same care one for another. Is that all right? I want to talk to you about, I, I, you say, you, you already preaching. I, I know I went a little long with that, with the opening. That was my opening. Amen. But I say all that to say the question of today is, am I? I don't want you to think of anybody else. Am I, are you, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? And for this, I want you to go with me to what was read in our hearing, Genesis chapter 4. We're going to take a lesson from a man named Cain. Is that all right? Some of us in our lives have been Cain. <coughs> We've not always been able. Is that all right? I know sometimes we would like everyone to think that we've always had it together. We've always want people to think that we have it together now. But the truth of the matter is, we need God at all times. Genesis chapter 4, starting with verse 8, the word of God says, And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother, and slew him. I want you to notice the usages of brother throughout this passage, throughout this passage of scripture, the word brother is used over and over and over again. Amen. And he says, and the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Not face value, that doesn't seem much like much. But I'm telling you, it's a lot in this scripture. Yeah. And we need to really examine how did Cain get to this point? You see, a lot of times we judge things at face value. We just judge people's actions. And we never understand how they came to that point. Is that all right? Some of us look at each other and say, well, that's, that, that person is no good and this and that. And you never know what happened to them to, help, ha, to, to cause their behavior. Is that all right? Sometimes there's things that went on before that. And it's important for us to really look and see how did Cain get to this point where he slew his brother. Is that all right? 
and the message will be good for us because we'll see what can cause us to get to a point where we want to be at odds with one another. Go back with me to verse number one. Is that all right? Verse number one. The word of God says, and Adam knew Eve, his wife. Amen. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she bare again his brother Abel. Now, some would say, well, because the word conceived is only used once, then it stands to reason they must have been twins. Well, that's speculation. We don't know that for sure, but we know what the context reads, right? And she bare again Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now you say, well, why is this important? Well, you have to understand these guys didn't just come up with these occupations. You have to really investigate the text. These were things that Adam had learned from God himself. He learned how to till the ground. He learned about sheep because when he sinned, God had to slay a sheep to cover him and his wife. So these are things, and you have to understand that this is what he taught his sons, how to till the land, how to keep sheep. Is that all right? And the Bible says in verse 3, in the process of time, or in the end of days, in other words, some years went by, y'all. It came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. You see, you have to understand that the worship of God is not something new. It's not something novel to us today. Worshiping God is from the beginning. Amen. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Now, these boys didn't come up with this on their own. Necessary inference teaches us that their father had to have, this is the patriarchal age, their father had to teach them what to offer the Lord. Amen. And I'm here to tell you, it's never too young to train up a child in the way they should go. Is that all right? It's never, never too early to train up a child in the way they should go. Is that all right? But you have to understand that when they get of age of accountability, amen, and they obey the gospel for themselves, they have to give to God for themselves. And this is what's going on. Cain and Abel are coming to give an offering of themselves to the Lord. Is that all right? Sometimes we, we want to try to make our children do some things sometimes, but it comes a time when they have to be responsible to God for themselves. You've done what you can do. You've done what God told you to do. Now they're on their own. Is that all right? So he says, again, Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. Is that what your Bible says? While Abel brought of the firstlings, Bakarah, the firstborn, the chief, the best of the best. Is that all right? Now hear what I'm saying. Abel brought the best of the best. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits or the best of all thine increase. Amen. Did you give God your best today? That's between you and God, but God knows. Is that all right? Now watch this. In the latter part of Proverbs 3, 9, it says, it says this, watch. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase, so shall thine barns be filled with plenty. So God is telling us, you do right by me so that you can be blessed. Some of us wonder why we're such a mess in our lives. Is it because you're, you're, you're stiffing on God? Are you robbing God? You say that's not your lesson today. You're right. I just thought I'd drop that in there. Is that all right? We give God not what's best sometimes. We give him what's left. And we expect him to bless us. Hmm. Let me move on. I want you to understand Going back to Genesis 3, it says, again, verse 5, But Cain, but unto Cain, and to his offering, he had not respect. But let me go back to verse 4. Let me get it all. 
and Abel. He also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect or accepted. He had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and his and to his offering, he had not respect. Now, I want to stop right here just for a second to deal with this because there's a lot of controversy about this scripture. We look at this scripture and immediately, amen, sometimes we want to make context where there is no context. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? In other words, sometimes we want to make this text say something that it doesn't say. We try by our own mind sometimes to figure out, well, he must have accepted Abel's offering because of this. And we try to come up with the reason of our own minds. And we, we look at the text and, well, he must have accepted it because of this. And he didn't respect Cain's because of that. But when you really, amen, exegete this scripture or bring out from this scripture what it what it's really saying you have to understand that's what the bible teaches us study yourself study to show yourselves approved unto god is that all right yes. study to show yourselves approved unto god a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly rightly dividing the word of truth in other words sometimes guess what the text doesn't give us everything so guess what we have to do no we have to we have to study right and I study what some man has said. We got to study the word. People love a lot of commentary, but I'm telling you the best commentary of scripture is the scripture. Rightly divide it. Is that all right? You see, some people say, well, well, he didn't accept Cain's because Cain's heart wasn't pure. But you don't see that in the text. You say, well, Cain, you know, he... he God asked him, why is, this can why is this countenance fail? Why is he angry? That didn't happen until after his, his offering was rejected. Is that all right? Are y'all hearing me? Some would say, well, uh, well what, what, what Abel offered was, was more. It was, it was the best. Like we just talked about, it was the best. It was more than what Cain gave. Well, it doesn't talk about the value of what they gave in this scripture text. Is that all right? You see, all explanations of why God rejected Cain's offering are absolutely unsupported in this text. What you have to do is study the whole counsel of God. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. And God is going to tell us why he accepted Abel's and why he rejected Cain's. Is that all right? Hebrews. Chapter 11, amen, starting with verse number four. If you have it, say amen. The Bible says, by faith, by faith. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now understand, he was accepted because he did it, by faith. Amen. Now, a lot of times when we're talking about faith, because everybody says they have faith, right? right? But we're not talking about your personal faith. We need to break down what it means that Abel offered it by faith. Is that all right? Let me just say this. Let me just wrap it up right this. The reason God says Abel's faith or Abel's offering was accepted and Cain was not is because Abel offered his by faith. Now, what is faith? What is faith? Substance of things hoped for? Evidence of things not seen? 
So it's what we stand on. The substance is what we stand on. But understand, we don't get faith by ourselves. Faith is not of us. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So faith is simply what God has said. So in essence, God accepted Abel's because Abel gave God what God asked for. And you got a lot of people worshiping God today, on the Lord's day, but they're not giving him what he asked for. You see, you need to understand, Cain was the first innovator. You say, what is that? Innovators and changers of God's instructions always try to justify themselves. God says in the New Testament, he shows us by example that the apostles came together on the first day of the week. Man says, no, nah, man, I got to watch football on Sundays. So we're going to we're going to worship on Saturdays so we can have Sunday all to ourselves. God didn't give you permission to do that. See, you making worship about you and it's all about God. Is that all right? You see, we need to understand then when he says again in Hebrews 11, 4, he says that by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous. Wasn't that. Abel in and of himself was righteous. He was righteous because he did what God said. You see, we're not righteous. We, we can't stand before God ourselves at all. We have to be in Christ, who the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 was made righteousness for us. And we have to do, amen, watch this. I want to show you something. Go with me real quick to Acts, Acts chapter 10. Because you have to understand, some people try to make this about, well, God liked Abel and he didn't like Cain. No, God is not a respecter of persons. Amen. Acts 10, 34 and 35. Look at this real quick. Peter had to learn this. Acts 10, 34 says, then Peter opened his mouth. This is when he had, when God sent him to Cornelius. Is that all right? And even though Cornelius was a good man, he still needed the words of salvation. His goodness wasn't good enough. Is that all right? Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, what do you mean, preacher, worketh righteousness? What is righteousness? Go with me to Psalm 119 and 172. Psalm 119 and 172 says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. So when we do what God has said, when we do his commands, then we're made righteous. Is that all right? Are we getting this? I know I got off a little bit, but I'm going back. You see, the thing is, Cain, amen, his great sin was that he offered to God what he supposed would be just as good as what God actually commanded. You see, we get in trouble when we want to do what we think is right to do. Is that all right? Well, I know what God said, but I think God would like this. I think this would be just as good, God. Do you like this? God wants what he asked for. Is that all right? That's why he says in John chapter 4 and verse 24. Is that all right? He says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. According to what he said. Is that all right? That's our proscaneo. That's what we're doing right now. We have to worship him how he said. He's given us five articles to worship him, and he don't want those articles messed with. He don't want nothing subtracted from them articles. He don't want nothing added to them articles. Is that all right? That's what he called for. Amen. And then when we get to Romans chapter 12, 
Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, when we talk about our latreo, he still gives us what he wants us to do. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or latreo is the word in the Greek. That's a reasonable latreo. But watch this. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, without you and I renewing our mind in God's word, we don't know what's acceptable to him. We'll give him according to as we think. But we have to be renewed in our mind in this word. Amen. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Peter says we have to be renewed in this so we can know what's pleasing unto God. Amen. Are y'all getting me? You say, well, if we're talking about being our brother's keeper, why you go back to all that? Why you go back to worship and all that? What that going to do with being our brother's keeper? You see, you need to understand that how we act with one another is reflected in our relationship with God. If you're not right with God, you definitely ain't going to be right with me. If I'm not right with God, I'm definitely not going to be right with you. Is that all right? You see, we have to understand this. Let's go back to Genesis verses 4, Psalm 4 again, or 5, I'm sorry. But came unto Cain and to his offering... He had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, angry, and his countenance fell. God, I gave you what I thought would be just as good, and you don't want it? <sighs> See if I do something for you again. You don't want what I gave you? But this chump, you're going to take what he gave you? You see, we sometimes project on one another what we really got an issue with God with. You ever have somebody take something out on you that they had with somebody else just because you there? People sometimes when they're upset with somebody, they take it out on the person they love the most. I hate you. It's your fault. I deal with this on a daily basis. I know what I'm talking about. Amen. Amen. You have families who are just, just in total disarray because they don't understand why my family member is taking it out on me. And all I've ever did was be there for them. All I, did was, all I ever did was love them. And they taking it out on me. But the one who treated them bad, they, oh, hi, how you doing? They, they treat them okay. That don't make no sense. And what Cain is doing doesn't make any sense. He's mad with God. Verse 6 says, and the Lord said unto Cain, the Lord said unto Cain, y'all ain't getting this. You understand they had a relationship, y'all. They were close. The Lord said unto Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, should you not be accepted? Cain, what's your problem? All you got to do is what I told you to do. You know what to do. What's the issue here? If thou doest well, should not, or should thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door. And unto thee, shall be his desire and thou shall rule over him in other words just like brother LaCroix pointed out this morning Deuteron Deuteronomy 30 19 God has set before us the ways of life and death choose life amen many of us can look back to some of the worst decisions we made in our lives 
And guess what? We had a choice, y'all. We didn't have to do that. But sometimes we make, because our emotion is all messed up and we're being guided by emotion, we make decisions in the heat of the moment. And we suffer the consequences for the rest of our lives. So God is saying, listen, and we need to understand something about this. God is saying, he's already offered God the wrong thing. But notice God, he didn't say, man, get out of here. Away from me. He said, man, do the right thing. God always seeks to bring us to ourselves. He doesn't want us to be separated in our relationship. God is always seeking for us to get it right. He's long suffering with us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But watch in verse 8. And Cain talked with his brother, or with Abel, his brother. Now you have to understand this. In the Hebrew, it doesn't read like this. In the Hebrew, it reads as if he premeditated this, y'all. He actually went to his brother in a familiarity type of sense, like, hey, man, let's go. Let's go out to the yard. That's how he did his brother. He duped him. Premeditated murder. And you have to understand... What happens next? The Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel, your brother? Now, you have to understand God is omniscient. He knows. But you see, this is a reflection back from chapter three. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned and God said, what? Where are you, Adam? Where are you? Is that all right? Where are you, Adam? Notice he didn't call to Eve. He said, where are you, Adam? And in this situation, he says, Cain, where is your brother? You say, what sense does that make? God always calls the responsible party. The responsible party in chapter 3 was Adam. And this is Cain, because that's his brother. Is that all right? Are we getting this? He says, where is your brother? And we have to understand that in chapter 3, when God called Adam, Adam reluctantly, reluctantly told the truth. He said, did you eat of the tree that I commanded you not to eat of? Well, this woman you gave me, um, uh, uh, right? Trying to pass the buck. He reluctantly told the truth. But you understand, when you and I engage in sin, it only gets worse. So now sin shows up now. And when he asks, where's your brother? Where's Abel, your brother? Right? He said, I don't know. He goes to an outright lie. Is that all right? He goes from premeditated murder to an outright lie to the face of God. I don't know. Is that all right? And we have to understand, we are brothers keepers, Church of Christ. We are brothers keeper. Amen. And that's why I'm so glad Brother Allen and Brother Clark has worked tirelessly for this brothers keepers ministry. Because we need to go find out where our brothers and sisters are. Because God is going to ask you and me, where's your brother? Where's your sister? Where they at? Have you looked? It's not a matter of if you looked and they won't return. It's a matter of you didn't even try to look at all. Is that all right? Are we getting this? You see, in Cain, in Cain, the devil, Satan, was a murderer and liar from the beginning. The Bible says in John 8, 44, Jesus told those Pharisees, those Jews, he said, you of your father, the devil. He was, he's the father of lies. He was a murderer from the beginning. What is he talking about? He's a murderer from the beginning. Because he did it in his son, Cain. Cain sold out to Satan. And I'm here to tell you, I brought up all the worship things because you need to understand when, when we're not in line with God, we're subject to 
everything of the enemy. The enemy can have us when he wants to, when we ain't in line with God. Is that all right? You have to understand when we engage in sin and especially when we indulge in sin, sin, when it's indulged in, has no bounds at all. You'll do things. And many of us have done things that we just can't comprehend that God has forgiven us for. Because we still have an issue forgiving ourselves for what we did. Is that all right? So he says to God, I know not. I don't know where he is. But even worse than that, he says, am I my brother's keeper? Now, y'all need to y'all need to get this. Just like when Adam said, man, it's this woman you gave me. Put the blame on God. Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, God, on you be the blame. You're supposed to be his keeper. Are we getting this? It's as if, it's as if he's saying, why are you asking me? Are you not his keeper? If he's missing, on you be the blame, not me. Because I never undertook to keep him anyway. He puts it on God. But you have to understand, we're all responsible for each other. Now, let me show you the mindset. Cain could care less about his brother. All right. And that is a reflection of his relationship with God. So I'm here to tell you this morning, church, any one of us who is unconcerned in the affairs of our brothers and sisters and take no care when they have op when we have opportunity to help especially for their souls. When we're not concerned, we're speaking the same language as Cain. You're sitting up, worshiping God, and you haven't thought about going after your brothers or sisters. Philippians chapter 2. Starting with verse one. Paul talking to the saints at Philippi said, if there be any consolation in Christ. If any comfort of love. If any fellowship of the spirit. If any bowels of mercies. Fulfill ye my joy. That ye be like minded. Having the same Love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus cared. Jesus cared. Even when we didn't care about ourselves, Jesus cared. Cared enough to be beat within an inch of his life unrecognizable to go to a cross as if he himself was the sinner and paid the price for you and me, even when we didn't care. So the question is, and in your heralds you have a little yellow half sheet, care. The question is, do you care? Not your neighbor. Not the brothers, not the sisters. Do you care? Remember, Cain could care less. You see, it's impossible for us to be our brother's keeper if we don't care. Is that all right? And let me show you what I mean by cares. 
We need to care. See, in order to care, we need to be connected to God. Cain wasn't connected. That's why he didn't care. He left that relationship that he had with the Lord. And many times we want to do good things. We want to do spiritual things, but we're not connected. Sometimes we go in the basement and turn on light, little lamp. Why ain't this lamp working? And screw the bulb and everything. Then, oh, oh, it ain't plugged up. Some of us, as children of God, we're not plugged in to the source. Is that all right? You see, we need to be connected. Because only when we're connected can we be truly converted. You say, what do you mean? Many of us, and I'm not saying this in a condemning, judging way, but it's just the truth of the matter. Many of us are convinced. We're convinced. We even may be conditioned, but we need to be converted. In Luke 22, 31 and 32, Luke 22, 31 and, tw 31 and 32, Jesus said to Peter, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I pray for you that your faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen your brethren. In other words, Peter, you think you, you, think you are right now. Oh, Peter, I pray for you. When you are converted, when you've changed, when you're really, amen, committed to me, then strengthen your brothers. Some of us trying to strengthen one another, and we ain't even strengthening Christ. Is that all right? That's why the Bible says in Ephesians or Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, if a brother or sister be overtaken in a fault, ye which are what? Spiritual. Why didn't he say all of y'all restore such a one? Because he knew everybody ain't spiritual. Is that all right? You see, we be, need to be connected and being connected, then we can accept, A, we can accept the fact that we are accountable to God for one another. Remember back in Genesis 4, 9, God asked Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He was the responsible partner. He was accountable for his brother. And as Christians, we're accountable to God for one another. You said, I thought that's the elder's job. Absolutely, it's the elder's job, but it's your job too. Ain't they your brother? Ain't they your sister? You're accountable too. Remember, we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 25 and 26, he says, but that all members should have the same care one for another. You see, we're, account we're accountable for the welfare of our brothers and sisters. We're accountable. And when we're connected, when we're accountable, then we're able to restore. Only when we're connected so that we can be converted and then we're made to know that we're accountable, then we're able to restore. As he said in Galatians 6.1, if a brother or sister be overtaken in the fault, ye which are spiritual... Restore such a one. Is that all right? You have to be, watch this. We're talking about restoring. You have to be spiritual because I don't know about y'all, my life has issues. Anybody going through anything today? You got issues. You got your own problems. And for you to love God enough to say, you know what, I know, God, I got my problems, but I see my brother or sister over here going through it. I'm going to help them. Amen. Then we're growing. We're maturing to understand that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. You see, God will work out your issues when you just lay your burdens down and go help somebody else. You'll get that later. Is that all right? That's what it's all about, helping one another. Jesus didn't take one minute to wallow in his own sorrow. Even when he couldn't breathe on the cross, hanging there for hours, he said, Lord, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. He's thinking about other people, the people that's crucifying him. You praying for the people that's messing with you right now? You see, when we're able to restore letter E, one of the most important parts of care is enduring. Enduring. Man, is some things that you have to deal with with your brothers and sisters. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. You say here, here, and at home. See, Satan ain't worried about just messing with you here. He's coming to your home. Can I come in? Amen. So goes the home, so goes the church. Some of us struggled even coming this morning. Devil making you feeling all guilty. What you going down there for? You ain't worthy. You ain't worthy to be all around them, be around them people, them righteous people. You tell the devil to get off your back. I'm going down there because I ain't righteous. Amen. We the church come together. We don't go to church. We are the church. And we come as the church together to worship the righteous one. Because we need it. We're all sick. And we need help from the physician. Is that all right? But we have to endure. We have to endure. I want you to look with me real, real fast. And this will be it. I'm going to have to cut this short. I want you to come back to this evening at four because we're going to continue on this endure because we need to ask ourselves, is God asking too much? Whatever you and I have to endure, is he asking too much? We'll talk about that tonight. But second Timothy. Chapter two. Endure. Endure. I, I've talked to people all week, and I ain't talking about y'all, so if I don't think I'm talking about you, I've talked to a lot of people this week. Amen. Some of us have said, man, it's rough being a Christian. Absolutely. But it's beautiful at the same time. There's no other place that I'd rather be. I'd rather go through this than be out there, amen, without the help of God. So whatever I got to deal with up in here with you and you with me, amen, God be praised. I'll deal with that all day. I'll take it. Sometimes we want to be choosy in the, in the church. Or, I don't want this, God. I'll serve you if you give me this. God won't put more on you than what you can bear. Amen. And whatever he puts on you, amen, brother, it's for your development. I want you to be where I'm taking you. And this, 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 this trial right here ain't about where you're at. It's about where I'm taking you. There's some things up here that's going to that's gonna rock your world if I don't get, get you tested with this. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul talking to Timothy. And he always had to encourage Timothy. Timothy was a young preacher. And Timothy went through it, y'all. The people he served hated him because he was too young. This young bug man, he can't preach. He's too young. Amen. I feel you, Timothy. <laughs> he says, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able, who shall be able also to teach, I'm sorry, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness. Now you got to understand, he's not telling Timothy to endure hardness outside the church. He's saying, with your brothers and sisters, endure hardness. 
Amen. No man. Wait a minute. Let me go back. Endure hardness as a what? Good soldier of Jesus Christ. We want to be good soldiers. We have some good soldiers in our armed forces. Got some crazy people in the House and Senate telling them to go over here to do this and do that. And they're good soldiers because they do what they're told at the cost of their lives, at the loss of limbs. They're good soldiers. And we got to be good soldiers of Jesus that whatever he calls us to do, you do it. He says, no man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. In other words, let me break it down and we're done. Jesus is saying, the hard part is not what I'm asking you to do. The hard part is that you're struggling because you're still entangled up with things in this world. You're being pulled. And if you're going to serve me good, you got to let that stuff go. You're going to serve me fully or you ain't going to serve me at all. No man can serve two masters. Is that all right? We have to serve him. Watch this. Watch what Paul says. Verse 8, verse 9 of the same chapter. He says, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Have you ever suffered trouble as an evildoer? People try to make you look like you the devil. Amen. Like you wrong. Because you want to stand up for God and ain't trying to make it look like you wrong. Is that all right? We have to know that suffering for righteous sake, for, for righteous sake is pleasing to God. Is that all right? He says, when I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. In other words, I'm going to do it because I want other people to win too. Amen. When you care, you're going to endure for others. I've said enough. Are you your brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? I want you to know if you're here and you're not obeyed the gospel, you're not a member of the body of Christ, the church of Christ. You can come today and obey the gospel and be added, the Bible says, Acts 247, to the body. But you have to understand, if you're not in Christ, you can't be your brother's keeper. You're in need of being kept by God. God keeps us. Jude, verse 24 says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and and forever. Amen. You see, even when we keep each other, we're only able to do that because he's keeping us. Allow him to be your keeper this morning. You've heard the word. Do you believe it? Are you willing to repent of your sins? Turn from the world and turn to God. Are you willing to confess Jesus as the Christ, the son of God? Are you willing to be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Acts 2.38, Mark 16, 15 and 16. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And not only the remission of sins, but Acts 2.38 goes further and said, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in baptism and live faithfully unto death. 
You can respond to that call now. That's the gospel call. Amen. That endures to all generations, even today. Will you respond? It's between you and God. And for us who have obeyed the gospel, we need to ask ourselves and examine, are we truly our brother's keepers? As we together stand and sing the words of encouragement.